Good morning, good afternoon. Happy Saturday to you. So I uh, I ditched my wife. <laughs> she loves to read her Kindle rom-coms. She reads a bunch of those uh, romance novel crap. And uh, <laughs> she gets lost and loses track of time. And we were down there for a little while. And once it gets too hot, I have to, even under the umbrella, I don't, I don't like the heat like that. So too many people coming around. I was going to do the Twitter space right next to her because she had her earbuds in listening to her audiobook as she reads it. And the uh, population around us was getting a little loud. So I just told her outside, I'm just going to come back up to the room, get some AC, and hang out with you for a little bit. Um, I know I say this all the time, but I promise you that this will absolutely not be a long one. Um, she will absolutely get irritated by me not being down there because we're away. Uh, the reason why we took off down here again, obviously we're interested in uh, some real estate down in this area. And I wanted to look at one more property a little bit lower than where we are now. But it looks like uh, 30A on the Panhandle area of Florida is probably where we're going to be heading up to in a couple of days. So I'll be talking to you by way of hotel Wi-Fi like I am here. Everyone's doing well. Uh, three members of our family were in the hospital, uh, one of which my mom, uh, she's been released. So one somewhat life-threatening. The other two were just scares. So thank you for your concern. Everything is well otherwise. So I want to talk a little bit about this past week. Uh, the idea, if you hear the air conditioner running, the desk that I have in this room, they, they, they position it right next to where they have the air conditioning unit. So to me, it doesn't bode well for someone that would be working, but it is what it is. So <clears throat> I, I mentioned a few things this week. Uh, not a lot, but the things I mentioned this week were pretty much spot on. Um, I talked about how the NQ, NASDAQ futures for June delivery, NQM2023. Uh, I'll give you a moment. You can load that up on your trading view chart while we're talking. For those that are lazy and don't want to go through the process, I'm going to complain and wish you would just do a live stream and do it that way. Uh, I will be talking about it in review, so that way... Um, if you're bu you busy doing the yard work or working out, whatever, I'll have some visuals for you. But for the folks that just want to sit here and have a interactive time with me, I haven't had an opportunity to see much of the charts. Uh, we did some driving yesterday to get down into this area. And we'll be driving again tomorrow. And then uh, we'll work our way back up into northern part of uh, Gulf Coast of Florida. So it looks like I'm probably going to be securing another property down here. So she's really in love with this area. So got to keep the wife happy. So NQM2023, that's your trading view symbol for NASDAQ. And if you go out to your weekly chart, and you can pull that up on trading view by hitting the number one and then the W, hit that. Once you load up the NQM2023, It'll take you to your weekly chart. And I mentioned that we had a volume imbalance. I'll give you the actual dates on the weekly chart. So the high candle that makes the high of the volume imbalance, uh, that candle is going to be on your weekly chart on Monday. August 15th, 2022. That's what your chart should say on TradingView. And the next candle to the right for Monday, August 22nd, 2022. Uh, those respective candles where they have a wick not even touching. Uh, the separation between the bodies, that's the volume imbalance. And I went one step further this week and I took your attention into the actual gap. This is a liquidity void. I know people have referred to these liquidity voids in the past, uh, but there is no liquidity void apart from an actual gap where there is no volume, no trading, no printing of any price at all. 
uh, that resides between the low of the weekly candle formed on Monday, August 15, 2022 for NQM2023 symbol. And in the high of Monday, August 22nd, to, uh, 2022. Okay, and those respective price levels are going to be a high of 13,480.75 and that low of that volume, in, I'm sorry, that by uh, liquidity void, uh, it's an actual gap, 13,453 even. Okay, so uh, to the goober that said that uh, 13,453 wouldn't be hit this week, uh, it was, and so did 13,480 and three quarters. And I love how these folks have selective hearing. Okay. Uh, my focus for the upside was primarily on one specific market, and that was the NQ. You can go back to look at the tweets, and the weakness or any kind of shorts would have been on the S&P or ESM2023. Okay, um, I called out the levels in advance, told you what we were looking for. And if you put those on your chart and post the tweets as, as well, marking when and where I said it, you can see the major intermediate terms swings in the marketplace occurred right at those levels. Okay, so I'll, I'll go through them briefly here in my discussion, and I'll tell you what that might mean for ES going forward for this week. So uh, with those levels in mind, having 13,480.75 and 13,453.00 uh, on your chart for the weekly. Now drop down into the daily. You can get that by hitting the number one in the letter D, and that will take you into your daily chart. And those levels you can see pretty much repelled price on Friday. We went to consequent encroachment of that gap on Thursday. Notice that it went right between those two levels, 13,480.75 and 13,453 even. Okay, Thursday's price high came right up into a high of 13,470.25. So that's very nice to see that. That's a signature you want to see. Is it respecting that level? And then Friday, we opened, rallied up to it, had a little bit of a mohawk above the high that we would be looking for for that uh, gap on the weekly chart. And if you look at the tweets, I shared that gap with a blue rectangle in a tweet. So go back and look at the, I didn't do too many tweets this week, so it should be easy for you to find it. I also started the analysis off this week telling you that I was looking for and then was interested in that gap as a draw up. Uh, my concern was the CPI, obviously, you know, CPI can be you know, murder to us as traders. If we're off side, that means we're not on the right side of the marketplace when it's released. Um, it can run you over and tear your face right off. So you don't want to be positioned ahead of CPI uh, for that very reason. So I mentioned on the daily chart for NQ, I favored the upside, okay? So that way we know bias was, for me, sharing it with you publicly, I wanted to see it go higher. Admittedly, for CPI, you know, I don't want to tell you what to do because I don't want you to get hurt if I'm wrong. Uh, and traditionally, I'm wrong. Uh, it just so happens that I was right this time, but for transparency purposes, the majority of times on the CPI number, I'm not all that accurate because it is what it is. So. The, if I wasn't, uh, I'd be trading it all the time. So that there would be something else I would give you a model around it. But I, I've not been able to frame a model that is consistent ahead of CPI. Okay, so I stick with telling you, gun to my head, you know, this is the side of the marketplace I'm looking for. Even though I may say, look, if it's going to go down, it's going to go for this particular sell side. If it's going to go up, it's going to go for this particular buy side. Now, if you're a goober and you're listening to that and you stop right there and you take a sound bite of that and put it on the internet and say, look at this ICT does, you know, calls it high and low. Um, keep listening. Cause I always say gun to my head. I favor one side or the other. I did that this week again, like I always do. And I was framing it on the context of that daily candle on now you should be on trading view NASDAQ symbol NQM two zero two three on the daily chart. Put your mouse over and hover over the candle for Friday, May 5th, 2023. Okay, so uh, that particular day, that is your fair value gap on the daily chart for NQ, which is below the gap that had not been traded to and through 
Notice that the high on that particular candle fell short of that 13,453 even. Okay, so it didn't do anything on that day. That's the day the goober said, uh, uh, you said it was going to go to 13,453 and it tanked. <laughs> it's an objective. Okay, you have to wait for time and price to offer the setups. The fair value gap, we dropped down into that day. Basically, consequent encroachment, which is the midpoint between the low of candle, the daily candle of May 8th, 2023, and the high of the candle on May 4th, 2023. So those two respective candles, you should shade that in the, with a rectangle, extend it to the right. And the market rallied up, just fell short of the 13,453. And then the... Thursday, we had a trade up into the consequent encroachment, which is the midpoint between 13,480.75 and 13,453, respectively, in, in deference to that weekly gap I mentioned. And then on Friday, we opened, rallied up into it, through it, and then gave up the ghost and went back down into the order block that's formed on May 9th, 2023, on your daily chart, that down closed candle. With these levels in mind, and if you shaded that fair value gap with a rectangle on May 5th on the daily chart, you're prepared to drop down into the hourly chart with me. So let's do that now. Type in six zero and hit enter and your chart should drop down into an hourly chart. So you should be showing at least the price action from the 10th where it creates the low at 4 a.m. on Wednesday. Rated right essentially the consequent encroachment of that daily fair value gap I mentioned this week. Before it was a factor, I said, you know, I'm favoring that one. I'm interested in this area here. And my draw was to the upside and where specifically that weekly gap. Okay, so uh, those levels were shared with you. You knew about them in advance. I told you my bias. I told you what I'd be looking for. And I did some executions and you guys, you know, you had an opportunity to see that. So on Wednesday, uh, the market did, in fact, rally up. And then we had that huge rally up at 8 a.m., to 8.30, so we had a news driver come out. Uh, it came up, just fell short of, what is that high? 13,433.75, that candle is the 10 a.m. on Wednesday on the hourly chart for NASDAQ. And then we dropped all the way down into a repricing to the candles. High of 7 a.m. on Wednesday on the hourly chart. So all that buy side and balance sell side efficiency on the 8 a.m. hourly candle for NQ. We reprice back down to that, but notice the bodies, okay? Look at the bodies on the 1 p.m. and the 2 p.m. candle on Wednesday on the hourly chart. The wicks do the damage, but the bodies tell the story, okay? So if you'd read this, yeah, we reached down into that buy side and balance sell side efficiency, we also tapped into rebooked to the order block that's on the 3 a.m. candle on Wednesday. See that big down black candle? Well, my candles are black when they're down, but that's your bullish order block. So we had a fair value gap on the 8 a.m. candle, New York local time, and a bullish order block at 3 a.m. We repriced down to it, and the bodies themselves did what? Stayed at the current new week opening gap high and low right inside that range. And more specifically, the one hour candle at 1 p.m. on Wednesday and the opening price on the 2 p.m. candle on Wednesday, May 10th. Both of those candles bodies were right at current new week opening gap low, which would be last week's new week opening gap. Then the market rallied up, traded up into on 8 a.m., and you might want to be paying attention to these specific times, by the way. Uh, 8 a.m. on Thursday, May 11th, we went up to consequent encroachment, which was 13,466.75. You should have that noted. That's the midpoint between 13,480.75 and 13,453, which is that weekly gap I mentioned in tweets. So we went up to that midpoint of that, which is consequent encroachment, stopped dead in its tracks, went down, repriced into the fair value gap and bullish order block. The bullish order block is the two consecutive down closed candles on Wednesday, May 10th at 12 noon to 1 p.m. And the fair value gap forms on the 2 p.m. candle, which is a buy side imbalance. So it's on efficiency. It's that big up close green candle. We traded down into 
consequent encroachment of that. And that price level for consequent encroachment for that range uh, comes in at uh, 13364 <clears throat> Excuse me. Point, was that 0.75? Yeah. The low comes in at uh, 13361 and a half on the 10 a.m. Thursday candle. So it went just below a little bit and ride back up to consequent encroachment of the weekly gap and then pumped right on through it just above a little bit on the 9 p.m. candle on Thursday, hugged, traded around between that gap high on the weekly chart and consequent encroachment of the gap. And finally, on Friday, it gave up the ghost one more time, sweeping through the high of it and breaking down and trading all the way back down to a completely random current new week opening gap low. And your current new week opening gap low for NASDAQ should be 13,310.50, which just happens to be the Friday low of the day to the tick, not one short, not one over, right to the tick, formed exactly at 2 p.m. So my question to you is, we were only bullish on what market? NASDAQ. Okay. I mentioned that if you were looking at both of those indices, if you're looking at SPOOs, which is ES, it was unable to make higher highs and able to make lower lows when NASDAQ wasn't. Okay. So in your journal, you want to have, when you're looking at uh, relative strength, not the indicator relative strength analysis, looking for the weaker versus the stronger or stronger versus the weaker. Uh, you want to be looking for the longs in the market that's showing you it's willing to go higher when the other ones aren't and unwilling to go lower when others aren't. Either one of those scenarios, and I'll say it again, if a market is willing to go higher when other markets are not, and not just any other market, but closely correlated markets. So what are we referring to when we're talking about indices? We're talking about S&P 500, NASDAQ 100, and the Dow 30. So I don't care about Russell. Okay, I don't care about all those other garbage indices. You only need three to watch these markets, and you're going to use them comparatively. So a indice that is making higher highs or not, and I'm not saying it in the sense of a trend. Don't think it, it's limited to just that. Yes, it's true, but I'm not looking at it from the basis of trend. I'm looking at it on the basis of market structure. And liquidity and relative strength analysis. So if I'm looking at a market that's bullish or I deem bullish, I want to see that market perform to the upside faster than the other indices. That's the one I want to be buying because it's breaking out the higher highs before or over the unwillingness of the other indices. Uh, that is not always the case that would create a bearish scenario for s &T. And that's why I'm telling you when people watch me do this, or they'll watch a video where I'm starting to introduce a concept like the six sister concept. Um, someone that's just vaguely introduced to some of my things or learned it from somebody else or whatever, it's watered down. They have no idea what they're doing. You think you have an understanding and you don't. And you think that it's, it's a revamping of SMT. It's not. Okay. It, it's very similar to the idea when I'm talking about order blocks or fair value gaps. If I have a rectangle in my chart right away, the, 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 the average person on the internet says, well, it's supply and demand because look, he's, he's drawing rectangles on the chart. <laughs> that, that's not the same. So the, the logic behind what I'm saying is, is I want to be focusing on a specific market that I would be willing to go long. That market should be willing to make higher highs faster or before the other indices that are closely correlated to it. If it was used for Forex, and yes, this does work on Forex. So don't think that, oh, ICT is just talking about these futures contracts and I don't trade futures, so it's making me angry. I wish he'd start talking about Forex. I'm talking about markets. I'm talking about price delivery. I'm talking about algorithmic price delivery. So it's the same thing. I'm not willing to trade Forex. So because I'm trading futures, and specifically index futures, I'm teaching you the concept with the real market. I'm not talking about something after the fact. I'm not showing you a hindsight cherry pick thing. I'm telling you these things in advance and you're watching them form in your chart. That's mentoring. Okay. I'm showing you before the fact, even when I'm uncertain because of a CPI number, I still tell you what I favor. I'm telling you what market I want to favor when I'm going long. NQ stronger because ES is weaker than NQ. 
So from an algorithmic stance, okay, if you were taking that logic or that data, you would say, okay, I want to trade. So where, where's the trade form? Well, I want to be long because NQ has a gap. And if NQ has the gap and it's willing to make higher highs when S&P is not, and we'll get to that in a moment, and the Dow is unwilling to make the higher highs, so right away, we've already figured it out. We've singled out. We've put the highlight on what market, NQ. What do we want to do with that market? We want to buy it. We don't want to sell it until it gets to the end of the weekly range. When can that form? Thursday and or Friday. And we'll get to that too in this discussion. So I don't want to be going long on ES and I don't want to be going long on Dow. Now, that doesn't mean that there won't be a little bit of a spillover, okay, or a little bit of sympathy move. If there is a strong move to the upside with NQ, it might pull up the other indices, but not as much as NQ will go up. And in hindsight, I, I can talk with this now because I told you in advance it was going to be like this. Look at your chart. NQ outperformed to the upside. Dow and ES were lethargic. They were not willing to go up there. So my six sister concept is multifaceted. So you can't just run along and watch somebody put something on YouTube thinking they know what I'm doing. You have no idea what I'm doing. There's different approaches to using the six sister concept. There's times when using it with you and your present understanding of SMT, yes. There's a, that's one facet of SMT, but I'm teaching you a more advanced version of it where you can see like an x-ray view behind price where you should be focusing. For instance, if you're watching several Forex pairs, okay, you're watching Forex and maybe you're looking at the pound dollar versus the euro dollar, okay, and you want to know which one to be trading. Sometimes the euro is a better buy or a better short than cable. Even though cable can be exaggerated, cable's pound dollar, by the way. Just because the pound dollar can be a little bit more animated in the same way that NQ is more animated than ES traditionally. It's a little bit faster market. So that's a characteristic that you need to be aware of. So if you have a market environment that is showing you, for instance, if the pound dollar is willing to make higher highs, when the Dow, I'm sorry, when the dollar is either going sideways or wanting to go lower, but the euro is unwilling to make a higher high, which one do you want to be buying? Now, if you've watched last week or so where I started introducing the sixth sensor concept, you would think, okay, well, it's going to be the euro because it has to, it has to keep up with what the pound did. No, 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 no. That's, that is not, it's not that cut and dry. You have to learn more logic. I'm showing you and then I'm teaching you. So that way I'm showing you the concepts, what I used. I'm calling the levels beforehand. I'm telling you what I think is going to happen. I'm telling you what to look for in your chart. And your charts are printing off of those key swing points after I say them. So that way I'm teaching you to trust what I'm saying. So that way it's not just simply me talk about something. It's very complicated because this is complicated. It is complicated. It's not easy. It's not a one trick pony video where I can go out there and say, do this, do this, do this. And there it is. OK, um, I wish it was. And I thought about this long and hard for the last few months, how I could bring in this specific concept. Uh, do you need this concept? No, you don't need it. But I promise that I would teach things that I haven't taught before. Even my private mentorship doesn't even know this. The folks that have been with me since 2016, they don't know this. They're learning it right alongside you. And there's no advantage for them in this specific concept. They have no idea where I'm going with it. You don't know it either. I don't care how long you've been with me. I'm not trying to talk down to you, but you're trying to put things out into the community that is incomplete. You have no idea what I'm talking about. You have no idea where I'm going with the information and you have no idea what to do with it. So when I sit down, I tell you which market I'm favoring. I'm factoring in the willingness of the market itself to behave a specific way. That's market profiling. That's not market profile. OK, uh, I'm not talking about volume overlaid on a chart on a horizontal basis. OK, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about VWAP and, you know, all these other stuff. I'm talking about reading pure naked price action, relative strength analysis. That relative strength analysis yields the six sister concept when the specifics are in motion, when they're in play, when things are as they should be, 
based on my analysis and which will be future your analysis when you can do this independent of me, which is the goal. You don't want to be toggled to a, or not toggled, but tethered to me as a mentor. Like I have to constantly keep giving you breadcrumbs. At the end of this year, you're not going to need me for that, which is exactly where you want to be. It might be scary for some of you, but this is what you really want. You don't want to be relying on me or anybody else. You don't want to be buying someone's service, no one else's signals, none of that stuff. You want to be independent of yourself. From everyone else, you don't want to be doing anything that relies on anyone else's input. And you want to trust what you know, you know. But this idea of focusing on longs, you want to be looking at a market that's willing to already show its strength to go higher. And look back in recent price action. There should be indications in price action that shows you that it was unwilling to go lower on a specific swing or a number of candles in the past where a closely correlated market, in, in deference to the indices as we're talking about it here, NQ was not willing. It was not willing to make lower lows when ES and Dow was. Where does that occur? Well, if you look at the NQ low at 1 p.m. on Wednesday, May 10th, you see that? That's a higher low than that of that was formed earlier in the morning. Look at your 4 a.m. low. Now toggle to ES. All you have to do is on trading, you type in the letter E S M 2023. Everything will stay the same and it'll just go right to ES. And you'll see that on the ES, comparatively and respectively to those two turning points, there was a lower low at 1 p.m. on ES than the low formed at 4 a.m. on ES. But go back to NQ. NQM2023 on your hourly chart, and you'll see that, that that was a classic SMT divergence. So what was it indicating there? It was willing to show you that if you were following what I gave you this week, looking for that daily fair value gap that should be shaded on your hourly chart, where it dug down into that at 4 a.m. on Wednesday, May 10th, 2023. It was willing to go higher. Look at your ES. So ES M2023. On Thursday, ES failed to make a higher high than that of the high on May 10th at 9 a.m. So ES failed. It fell to the idea that I shared with it on Twitter. I said ES is weaker than NQ. Now, if I'm telling you one's weaker than the other, I'm indicating to you that if you are trying to trade intraday price action and you're just trading the intraday volatility, you're not really trying to worry about big runs, which is really where we're at right now. You know, we're, we still have not left this daily range where it gives this higher degree of swing trading probability where it can move and, and move in like weeks in the same direction. We're not in that environment right now, folks, and we haven't been for a while. So I don't know when we're going to leave that, but it, we have to trade accordingly. Does it mean we can't trade at all? Absolutely not. It just means you have to adapt. You have to adapt. I got down here, started sweating my ass off because I'm not used to this kind of heat. I'm used to being up north. <laughs> so I got to shed some clothing. I'm running around here with shorts and flip-flops and no shirt on. So no shoes, no shirt. But now we're talking new week opening gap. My mind was not on the half-naked women around me. Okay, I'm, it's not on my wife that's listening to country music that I can't stand listening to. My mind is, I got to look at what this chart was doing because I didn't get a chance to see it yesterday. <laughs> and I'm going through withdrawal. I want to know how we closed. I want to see what we did. So I wasn't permitted <laughs> to have the phone with me down there. So I'm going through a little bit of withdrawal. So I told her, I said, listen, I'm hot. I'm uncomfortable. You, know, you stay down here. Here's your Kindle. Here's an umbrella. Here's a drink. Enjoy yourself. When you're when you're done, just come back up to the room. So I'm here talking to you about these things. I'm looking at the chart for the first time since really half like half a day of Thursday. So I think around one o'clock or so on Thursday was the last time I, I peaked at price. And I want to see how we performed. And true to form, N NQ was the relative strength leader to the upside. And the shorts were better served on ES until here's the caveat. Until 
that weekly gap was delivered on NQ. So NASDAQ, once it goes, let's go back to your chart on NQM2023. That's your symbol for trading view. You should be on the hourly chart still. Look how on Friday, we stayed inside that new week. I'm sorry, that, that uh, weekly gap between 13,480 and three quarters or 0.75 and the low of 13,453 even. Look at all the consolidation around that between the 6 p.m. Thursday candle all the way to a move on, at 9 a.m. on Friday where we broke lower. And he came back and touched it on the candle at 10 a.m. So he opened at 10 a.m.'s candle on NQ or NASDAQ, opened on that hourly candle and traded right back up to that gap low right there at the 10 a.m. on Friday, one hour candle. That movement, okay, there's several things here, and the apt pupil will take this and write it down with a great deal of excitement to go through price action and see this does, in fact, repeat. It's not just a one-trick pony. This in itself is a model, folks. Okay, I, I've mentioned this many times in you know, teaching. Every time I brought in a new membership group of my private mentorship, which is no longer there, I'm teaching publicly, okay? So stop asking me. You don't need to pay me, okay? I'm teaching you things until November, and then I'm going away. I'm going to back to my personal life, okay? But uh, I have I have 81 very specific PD arrays, okay? I'm not going to teach all of them to you, but one of them I've made mention in public, and I've taught it in my private mentorship. Uh, it's the immediate rebalance. OK, um, if you look at how, for instance, look at your NQ chart, NQM2023, hover over top of the Wednesday, May 10th, 2023 candle on NQ, your hourly chart. It should show that it's 2 p.m. if you're set to New York local time, which is how you should have your trading view chart set. So that way you can follow me. And it's also how the algorithm runs. It's, everything's booked and priced on New York time. I don't care where you are, who's told you different. It is what it is. <laughs> OK, this is it. So that bullish candle, that buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency, that is a fair value gap. It does not completely get repriced to the low, which is the high of the candle at 1 p.m. on May 10th of 2023, when we drop down on the candle on Thursday, May 11th, 2023. Okay, that 10 a.m. candle, we've made that low of 13,361 and a half. It did not completely trade down to the low of the fair value gap. So it left some of that open. That fair value gap is a draw when price is above it and it seeks discount. If you go back to that candle at Friday, May 12th of 2023 at 10 a.m., that candle opens at 13,445.00. Notice that? If you're hovering over top of it, looking upper left-hand corner, midpoint of your chart, and you'll see the opening price, 13,445.00. Then the high forms at 13,005, I'm sorry, 13,454.75. That repricing, okay, that repricing is doing two things. Two, two specific things are occurring there. It's repricing back to a low of importance what, what low would that be hover over top of the 8 a.m on friday may 12 2023 okay so that low comes in at 13,453.75 now that 0. 0.75 is like creating the opportunity for a mohawk okay a mohawk is where the price action just goes just a little bit past a very specific level and when you're trading we look for very specific things in precision, yes, but there's always going to have to be this gray area, which is what I taught in Forex, where it's usually three to five pips. Okay, so uh, because there's different brokerage firms and, and brokers are using different liquidity pools and their own in-house liquidity pools when you're trading Forex, uh, there, isn't no, there is no centralized exchange. There's no, you know, everybody has the same price. That creates an opportunity like in the beginning. Um, when Forex became a thing where it was opened up to the public, it was the wild, wild west. I mean, brokers were getting away with murder, stealing and robbing people. Okay. And it's gotten way, way better 
but there's still this disadvantage in terms of in-house liquidity versus centralized liquidity where everybody sees this candle at friday may 12th 2023 at 8 a.m we all every single trader every living soul that wants to handle the nq on delivery contract june of 2023 we all agree that that high is the same high price we can see that it's there we can see that that's an advantage over futures over forex over crypto over whatever okay uh, this has a built-in advantage and it's much more refined it's much more mature of a marketplace and if crypto goes the way of the dinosaurs because of central bank digital currencies which i'm holding that that's possible and i don't i don't want to be involved in forex or you know trading fx when we're moving into this central bank digital currency like i don't i don't understand the risks and how far and vast it can be and that's why I've counseled you to just at least respect that risk. You do what you want to do. If you want to keep trading Forex, go right ahead. You're in charge of your own finances. I'm not giving you financial advice. I'm telling you this is the reason why I won't touch them. Because at any given time, something can happen and we can have a depegging. We can have something crazy where if I'm in that, I could get wrecked very quickly. And anybody else could be crazily destroyed. Just the same way when the euro and the Swissy was depegged. And thousands handle you know just boom just like that instantaneously and brokerage firms themselves were instantly insolvent and out of business instantly so if you have not paid attention to the things i've been talking about for several years you know we're in we're entering that so i'm going back to my roots this is where i started i was a commodity trader and this this is the market that i felt most confident about index futures and bonds. So I don't I don't personally care if Forex goes away or if we go to a one world currency or this, that, and other thing, or crypto takes over everything else. We're still going to have the futures market in the form of index futures for stocks. There's going to be companies publicly offered. Okay. That's not going to go away. So that's the reason why I went back to this. So that way for the folks that are out there running around giving up, you know, their own opinion about what I'm doing, why I'm not doing this and that. I'm reiterating what I've already said many times before. But that candle at May 12th, 8 a.m., you know, yesterday, Friday, at uh, on the hourly chart for NQ for NASDAQ, that low comes in at 13,453.75, which is 0.75 or three quarters of a point or three ticks above the low of that gap on the weekly chart that I showed you, which is at 13,453 even. The high of the candle at 10 a.m. comes in at what? One point above that low. So it's allowing for what? It's allowing for that low that formed on 8 a.m. on Friday to be booked. No person that would be long aiming for that low as a target for a, a short entry or a long exit. And high frequency trading algorithms would have used that. Just buying that opening price at 10 a.m., an algorithm could go long there and sell at the low on the 8 a.m. candle. That's high frequency trading. They go up and down all day long, firing all day long. Boom, 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 boom. And it's reading these inefficiencies in price action. Because of that candle that formed at 9 a.m., the candle between the two I've been referring to for the last few minutes, the 9 a.m. May 12th, one hour candle. If we would have not made the high on the very next candle at 10 a.m., as high as we did, and it matched the low of the 8 a.m. candle, if that would have fell short of that, when the candle opened at 11 a.m., we would have a fair value gap up there. But because the market did this, it opened and rallied up to the new week open. I'm sorry, I want to keep calling it a new week opening. It rallied back up to the 13,453 low of the weekly gap and repriced to the 8 a.m. candles low. That makes that an immediate rebalance now an immediate rebalance this is for your notes okay i know you guys like to do other things 
just note that at this minute marker, okay, look at your time on this Twitter space if you're watching it live. Send yourself a, a text message to this specific time so that we can go and write the notes down. Whenever price offers that to you and it's an immediate rebalance and we've already met an objective, what's the objective? The weekly gap I told you. Were we able to make higher highs after that? No, it just you know, hugged around right above that 13,480.75 level on multiple hours between the 8, 8, I'm sorry, 8 p.m. on Thursday all the way to the 9 a.m. For 12 hours, it just stayed around inside that gap, but just wanting a, no real interest above the high that was formed at 9 p.m. on Thursday, which came in at 13,494.25. So that immediate rebalance is a signature that tells smart money that the algorithm will start spooling price. That means it starts sending it. Boom. Where's it going? Down. Where's it going to seek? Inefficiencies. Okay, well, let's put your candle. I'm sorry. Put your cursor right on the uh, 10 a.m. candle on NQM2023. That high reprices back to a specific price level. The weekly gap low, we've already filled it. We have balanced it. What does that mean? We went up through it. We passed down through it. And then we went up, tried to chase, uh, uh, test it as going through it once more time, one more time. And we failed immediately with a immediate rebalance. So what's, that's the reason why I coined it immediate rebalance. When it rebalances like that, you don't need the, the range is too short in time. You only have those three candles. The candle formed at 10 a.m., at 9 a.m., and 8 a.m. And 8 a.m. is low. It rebooks two and allows the price to be offered one point above that. That's allowing for smart money to get short there. It does not, it will not go back to the high of. 13,480.75. And I know when you hear that, it sounds like, oh, he can say that now because it's hindsight. Look at my trades, folks. Look exactly at every single time I place a trade and where I'm placing my stop loss. You don't see that in retail books. You have no idea why I'm doing those stop placements unless you have trained with me. I know that the algorithm won't go back to those levels. And if it does, say I'm wrong, I'm human. Say I'm wrong, I get that wrong. Then I know that I'm going to sit sideways and do nothing for that session or look to reverse. I'll teach you that this year, but there's things that you have to learn incrementally. You can't just say, okay, I'm gonna have a conversation with ICT. He's gonna tell me everything he needs to tell me in a couple of videos, boom, boom, boom. And I'm gonna know everything I need to know and, and I'll never have any questions about this or that. No, you're gonna have all kinds of questions. You're gonna have a lot of questions when I'm done in November that pertain to you personally, but not how you're gonna trade. You're gonna have a, a plethora of ideas that you can go in and find setups. And this is one of them. This is a model that in and of itself can absolutely do everything you need for trading and not have to do anything else. Don't you always say that, I see? I see yes, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. I have lots of models. I could create a new model every single day and they would be independent of one another and they are offered every single week. See, that's the problem with all of you that are coming in here and you're feeling rushed. I need to learn this right now. I got to get funded. I got to do this. I got to do that. Blah, blah, blah. No, you got to settle down, man. You just settle down. You have to allow yourself to grow an affinity for one thing that I've taught or will teach. And then once you know what that is, then you pour all your attention and your focus into that. Be a master of one thing. Don't try to be a master of everything. It took me three, three decades to know what I know to be able to do what I can do. You're not gonna learn it just because I can do it. I'm not gonna be able to teach it to you real fast and short. And the five minute trainer guys out there on YouTube, they're trying to condense my stuff. They're not gonna help you either. They're not. And I get it. They want money, they want clicks, they want you know, uh, you know know the attention or whatever, but that's not gonna help you. You have to find something that resonates with you. And this immediate rebalance, it can be a model or for me, most of the time, it's just a confirmation that, okay, I'm about ready to see what? Strong down move. I want to see large range candles. I saw a, a person uh, send a tweet to me. How did you know, ICT, when the market's 
going to have these big sudden rushes and big candles. How do you always do that in the, in the review videos, uh, your videos and reviewing things and you're showing your executions? You type it out and you know exactly when it's going to happen. It's things like this. This signature here. I have about a dozen of these types of specific things I'm looking for that tell me right when speed and magnitude should enter the marketplace and start to, to take right off. When I'm looking for something, right away it should take off right at that candle or the very next one. That is anticipation. That's not reacting to price. So you need to know what you're looking for. Why should it form? Where will it form? And where is it going? If you placed your cursor on that 10 a.m. candle, you can see that the high went right up to the low of that gap. That you, If you would have never placed it on your chart, it would completely be hidden from you. Notice that. You have the lines on your chart because I told you about it. Everyone outside of our circle has no idea that that thing even exists or that's even worth having any mention of. And they're surprised at how price reacted on that on Thursday and the Friday. They have no idea why it did what it did. But let's go over a couple things. What did price do all week in NQ? Go higher. Where did price originate that long price swing higher? Inside that daily fair value gap, as I mentioned, I was interested in that and seeking the, the premium. So I gave you what? The discount to premium. I gave you the bias. I told you what market I was favoring. I wanted to be in NQ. What market should you be focusing on for longs? NQ. So go back and do your back testing on that this week, today, or tomorrow. And look at all of the time frames and what you can see, what you can find. And don't be worried about the fact that you're looking at after the fact. Everything is learned in hindsight. Every doctor that ever does a, a surgery on you or anyone else or your loved ones, they all did back testing. They all did hindsight study. They worked with a cadaver that was not alive when they cut on it. Don't be afraid to work in the sandbox. Don't waste your time doing silly things to rush through that thinking, I got to trade with a real account because I won't learn unless I do it with real money. The only thing you're going to learn is that you should have never done it as soon as you did. I promise you, every single one of my students that have ever done that have always sent me emails and regret saying, I wish I would have listened to that. That's the most regretful thing I always receive from, uh, from students is they wish they would have never went to live fund trading as soon as they did. And they went back to square one. And the ones that made it, they understood rushing to that point. That makes this whole process longer for you. Because now you're listening to me stressed out because you either lost money, you're in drawdown, or you've wasted money on trying to get a funded account passed, or you lost your live account, or you're now afraid to take trades. And you can see them after they happen, and you knew they were likely to do it, but you're afraid to push the button. Why? Because you lost money before you learned how to reprice. So now everything is completely skewed. You have no idea what to trust anymore. So that means you have to take some time away from the marketplace. What does that mean? Two weeks. If you're all messed up, you're confused, you don't know what to do, take two weeks. No markets, no ICT, no videos, nothing. No social media, completely devoid of all market action. Nothing. And unplug. And then come back, start at square one again. Don't think you know everything. Don't assume, oh, I watched this video before. I did this before. I, I did this exercise. I did this back testing stuff before. Go through it all over again. And forgive yourself for making the mistakes that you did. Because everybody that succeeds forgives themselves for doing all the silly stuff they did. I didn't, I didn't find myself until I forgave myself for all the silliness trying to make something happen with such an infant mindset about understanding what I think price is going to do because of some indicator. So I, I got rid of all that stuff. And when you start seeing signatures like this immediate rebalance, it repeats. It's indicating that it doesn't want to leave a fair value gap. Why? Because it ain't going to it ain't going to be wanting to come back to it later on. Not in not in the immediate future. See, my fair value gap is a deferred repricing it's a deferment to a later in, in in time it will come back to that so that's the reason why i teach you to take scaled 
profits. When you listen to these goobers out there, they don't do any executions. They don't tell you what they're doing. They don't show you what they're doing. They haven't called anything. They're not doing anything. But they got an armchair opinion about everybody else, not just me, but everybody else out there. Everybody else is a scammer. Everybody out there is doing this and doing that. But the people that are really doing it, like me, I'm calling out, I'm telling you, and teaching, and showing people with making real money. This stuff repeating, it's like clockwork, Swiss precision. And they're going to tell you, partials are stupid. It's dumb. You took this much risk when you put the uh, trade on first, and then you took something off. That makes no sense. Okay. Making money doesn't make sense to you then, period, apparently. If you are entering on a fair value gap, Okay. If you're entering on a fair value gap, you will be better served as a developing student to take partials when the price is giving it to you. If, okay, here's one of those unicorn moments where you should be writing this stuff down. If you get an immediate rebalance where price does something that would otherwise, in normal instances, this should have created a lower high on the candle at 10 a.m. On your NQM2023 NASDAQ hourly chart, Friday, May 12th at 10 a.m. New York local time, that high of that candle, and in any other instance, if we didn't trade back to that weekly gap low there, that would have formed a fair value gap at the 9 a.m. hourly candle. Absolutely would have done that. I would have anticipated that. And then I would have anticipated a run right back up into that as long as the low at 10 a.m. on Thursday hadn't been traded through. Because right below that is sell side. Now, from that low all the way up to the high formed at 9 p.m. on Thursday, there is no fair value gap in that price swing. There is no inefficiency. It's back and forth, but still going higher. So what is going to be the draw from that immediate rebalance at 10 a.m. on Friday? The sell side liquidity and what? The open portion of the, the 2 p.m. Wednesday Hourly buy side and balance sell side efficient. That big green candle or big candle, a closed candle at 2 p.m. on Wednesday, May 10th, 2023. So those are two targets. And best case scenario would be what? Returning back to what? 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 New week opening gap. It's a magnet, folks. That's where fair value exists for the week. The weekly range, the weekly candle has a built-in fair value gap. That is my new week opening gap. That's the reason why I teach it to you the way I teach it. Everybody else that sees that gap, if they watch it or if they see it like that, oh, it, it filled the gap. They're done. They're done. There's never been a writer. There's never been an author. There's never been an educator. There's never been a trainer. There's never been anybody else out there ever that ever talked about this logic but me. And I say these friggin' things because I'm tired of little boys on YouTube crowing about how, yeah, this guy's supposed to have concept and he has this and he has that. Motherfucker, I'm calling this shit like to the tick. You're out there trying to get fucking funded accounts. Can't get fucking payouts. Can't do shit. Stop talking about me, motherfucker. Mind your own fucking business. You can't keep up with me. Okay, I'm being fucking nice to all you motherfuckers. I'm allowing you to have an audience. Immediate rebalance. You do not take fucking partials. You don't. You don't take partials on immediate rebalance because it's going to have a different type of delivery. It's going to be sudden. It's going to be one-sided. Boom. Avalanche. Blast off. Straight up vertical or straight down. In this case, that gap that we had on the weekly chart for NQ I talked you about, it's repricing. It's going right up into that low and repricing to the low at 8 a.m. It's not allowing a fair value gap to form on the nine o'clock handle. So once it reprices immediately right to that, we already know. We already know that Thursday and Friday, if we've been seeing prices going higher for the entirety of the week, which is what we saw in NQ, it hit our objective. What was the objective we're looking for? That gap closure on the weekly chart between 13,480.75 and 13,453 even. So it's already worked that level. It's filled it in. It's balanced it because it's offered upside delivery. In other words, prices moved from the low of 13,453 up to 13,480.75. It has done so in up closed candles and down closed candles. So because it's offered two sided delivery, 
that range that was in inefficiency at one time before i mentioned it we were we were looking at a chart that had an actual gap there there was no buying and selling between those two price points it was devoid of any trading which makes it by definition a real liquidity void it is not the candle that is formed at 10 p.m on wednesday may 10th that is not a fucking liquidity void okay that's not a liquidity void that's a buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency. Liquidity was offered there. Void is, when you say liquidity void, what is the subject matter? Liquidity. What, what about it? What's the story? What, what, tell, me, tell, me, tell me about it. What's, what, what's the big deal about it? It's void of any liquidity. No buying or selling took place. A buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency. That means it's one sided offered. That candle at 2 p.m. May 10th on your alley chart for NQ. Buy side was offered predominantly in, in comparison what was inefficient. It didn't allow price to go back down to the previous high on 1 p.m. May 10th on your alley chart for NQ. Until we got to Friday at noon. And then it trades down into what? Current new week opening gap. Oh, this guy. He's full of shit, man. He's making it up as he goes along. How many times? How many times have you seen my new week opening gap get respected throughout the entirety of the week? Create very specific highs and lows. And we see it again here. Now, we're not supply and demand. We cut through candles going all the way back to Sunday. Price has gone up, down, through it, all around it. It runs quickly off that immediate rebalance. So what does that mean? What does that mean for you as a trader? Well, you don't want to be taking partials in between the range of 13,453 or 440. Four, in that vicinity that where that's where you could have been going short anywhere in that and the 13 handle range you could be getting short there off of that immediate rebalance had i been in front of the charts on friday and not driving i absolutely i absolutely would have been selling short there at the touch of that 13,453 even i would have been all over hammering it and if it went, went above it a little bit more and touched the low of the 8 a.m candle on Friday, May 12th, I would have added more. And I would have taken no partials until we drew back down into new week opening gap. I need not have gotten that low, but I would have aimed for one tick above the high, which is 13,316.25 for me. And that would have filled. And I would have been peacocking around saying, ha here's another trade. <laughs> and I didn't get the very low, which is the new week opening gap low, but it it would have been another trade I would show. I would have been like, need a dose? Here it is. But no partials would have been taken. None. And how many hours did it take to move from that immediate rebalance at 10 a.m. down to the new week opening gap? Three hours. It hits the high of the new week opening gap at 1 p.m. Then at 2 o'clock, it makes the low of the day and trades very precisely. Not one tick off. The low is the 13,310.50 level. You see it? Hover over top your 2 p.m. May 12th, 2023 on Friday. At 2 p.m. in New York local time, that candle's low is 13,310.50. That is the absolute low of the new week opening gap. Had you never been taught this, that low would have been completely a surprise to you. And for three fucking decades, I have watched this stuff happen every single week that goes by. It's happening all the time. And it's never going to change. It's never going to stop working. It's never going to be reprogrammed. It's never going to be changed. It's never going to be made obsolete. So stop fucking worrying about it. Use it. If it would have been tainted by me teaching it, my flesh would have kept me from teaching it. I'm promising you that. I'm promising you that I would have never shared that. If I believed in my heart, it would change. Greed, selfishness would have kept it. 
Can you just respect the fact that I'm being that honest with you? You keep asking me these things. Stop. If I'm teaching it, it's going to keep fucking working. There you go. The stuff that I won't teach, it's not, it's not for the public. It's too good. And you probably look at this saying, what the hell? Yeah. Next level shit. Next level shit. But you don't need that. Look what I'm teaching you here. Look what I've already taught. Look at the fucking money these people are making around the world. They're all doing the same shit now. They're all doing it independent from me. I'm not telling them what to trade. They're trading their own setups. They learned. They took the information. They made it their own. And they did exactly what I told them to do. Show me what you do with it. Run with it. I want to see what you all do. I'm encouraged as a mentor to see all of you do that. I love it. I want to see you succeed. But many of you are just sitting around twiddling your thumbs, worrying about, man, there's no, there's no point in me doing this because you know, it's, it's just going to stop working as soon as I start doing it because everybody else is doing it. Dude, you're not a trader. Because traders don't fuck around and, and think about that kind of stuff. We're doers. Traders are people that do shit. Talkers. Talkers that don't do shit. They're never in these markets making any kind of waves. They're not calling anything out. They're not taking any trades. They're not booking any profits. They're not doing any withdrawals. They're not doing shit. But sitting there worrying about what if, what if, what if. If you are a what if person, you need to change it to it is what it is. That means this is a setup. I'm fucking taking it. I'm taking that trade. I'm taking, I'm getting in there and I'm taking initiative. I'm doing what it is I'm supposed to be doing. That's an opportunity. Why the fuck am I not doing it? It's not like these things are going to jump out and surprise you. If you've been learning from me, you expect this. You anticipate this stuff. You're not reacting to it. You're not surprised. You're not shocked. Holy shit. Where did that move come from? You know, it, that doesn't happen here. That only happens for new students. The enthusiasm. And yes, that's wonderful in the beginning. It feels like, wow, this is, I'm learning something I feel like I shouldn't learn. Is this illegal? What the hell's going on? But after a while, you get desensitized to it and you mature as a student. And you become part of our community. You're now part of this hive mentality. We're winning. We're the cult of fucking winning. Okay. If you got a problem with that, get the fuck out of here. We don't mess around with people that don't want to do the right shit. Okay. You want to make money. You want to learn how to read these fucking markets and know exactly what's going on. You are in the right place. I'm not asking you for a fucking dime. You ain't got to do anything but show up. Take notes and repeat that same thing every single week. And I promise you, come November, you're a fucking savage. Okay. You're going to know exactly what you're going to do. And if I collected half a dozen of you or a dozen of you and said, okay, come together right now. What do you trade? How do you trade? It's not going to be an agreement. But you're all going to be profitable. Independent mindsets looking for very specific things that are algorithmic. They repeat. They're time and, base, time and price based premise. These things are going to repeat because there is a fucking algorithm, because it's coded. It's going to do this shit because it's supposed to do it. Why did Friday deliver like that on NQ? Because it had already delivered what it was reaching for, and I told you at the beginning of the week. That gap filled, balanced, rebooked, lower. Random level? No. The shit I taught you. But there's two types of delivery. Delivery that allows you to do what? Sit back and wait because that full target is coming. Now, I've done examples of this executions where I take no partial. I pull out my heavy artillery, no partials. It's dominance. When that is in the price action, you have to know what it is doing beforehand so that way you can anticipate that type of trading. Otherwise, in the beginning, let me, let me slow down here for a second because I'm a little animated. You can tell I've spent a lot of time in the car listening to fucking country music. I'm pent up. <laughs> and there's country fans listening to me. And uh, don't take offense to it, but I just fucking can't stand country music. But anyway, there are some of you that are going to listen to this and say, okay, that's it. This is the, ne this is the next level. I'm going to skip over all the bullshit. I'm going to look for the trades that ICT aims for where there's no partials taken. You'll never get there like that. Because you have to learn gradually, which is why I teach all my students to take partials. Because you don't know when you're wrong. You don't know that yet. You can't identify when everything just has shifted in your favor from what you thought was a setup. Now it's confirming you're wrong. But because you don't have the experience, you don't know what that is in price action. You can't observe it. You can't identify it. So you can't do what? You cannot adapt and remove yourself from risk or reverse. 
So you'll fall victim. And you may have had an unrealized profit in paper where you didn't take the trade off. With even with a live account, you could have unrealized profit that was handsome at one moment. And then something shifts in that market structure and you overstage your welcome and it turns on you and it becomes a losing trade. And then you're, what you're going to think about that as a new student or a new trader is this shit doesn't work. It's it's a scam. It's a fraud. This stuff is never going to work out. They're changing the other. And instead of saying, yeah, at one time I had two thousand dollars in profit, but my dumb ass didn't fucking take it because I don't want to take partials because I listen to some fucking joker on the Internet. You have to take them as you grow. OK, you have to take the fruit as it's offered. It sustains you. It rewards you. And that is what's necessary. Now, I said as many times as a martial artist you know, in, in the Western world, we have all these different colored belts. You know, in Asia, there is no belt system like that. It, it's, a, it's a westernized version of rewarding lazy fucking people. OK, and there's so many people that join services, gyms, martial arts, whatever. OK, anything that takes effort. If it's being monetized, it's always put in a graduated you know, presentation because most people are going to quit. That's the reason why I did 12 month mentorship, too, because I'm not going to lay all my good shit down for the guy that just wants to join one fucking month. Fuck you. You ain't going to put the time in. I'm not going to lay it all out there. But for the people that want to bitch later on, I take them right back to month one content that you can see all on my YouTube channel. You don't need anything else but that. Month one core content. That is you quitting your fucking job. There it is. It's done. But you don't want to do that because it's not sexy. It doesn't have all the bling. It doesn't have all the hopped up on goofballs bullshit that's wrapped around with social media sugarcoating this and sugarcoating that. But that right there beats the brakes off of every fucking thing else. And it's boring. It's simple. It's straight to the fucking point, but nobody gives a fuck about it. Why? Because I don't go out there and make video series about it. I've tempted, I've been tempted to say, yeah, I'm going to go out here and come up with some silly ass fucking name. Okay. And I, you know, I guarantee you, had I done this, there would have been a huge group of the internet would, would be out there fucking making videos and making courses around it and shit. And if I called it like uh, market assassin, high frequency trading algorithm. What the hell? That's a banging ass title. Like I'm fucking watching that shit. That's the that's the stuff I want to see. Not new week opening gas. What the fuck? Nobody, nobody cares about that. I want to hear assassin shit. You know, I want John Wick's you know tutorial on trading. You know, that type of shit, right? So, but it would have been all one month one uh, core content, and I could have packaged that shit and made it look like it was completely, utterly brand new. But you still would be using the same vernacular and vocabulary from month one. And I would show trade examples and it'd be like, and it's just banging. Woo! It's fussing. <laughs> and it would have been just month one core content because you didn't apply it. Some of you are addicted to learning, but you aren't addicted to succeeding. You want to be entertained. And honestly, I have I have fun doing these things. I do. absolutely. I, you know, Lord forgive me. Sometimes I talk in language I shouldn't do. But it is what it is, okay? I'm not perfect. I'm a human being, and sometimes I feel like I have to have sentence enhancers. And I, I shouldn't be listened to around your children, okay, because I'm capable of going off the rails. But when I'm talking to you like this and when I'm telling you these things, it's for your edification. It's for you to be better, to know what it is that you should know, focus on the things you should be focusing on, and spending time studying price action with those premises in mind. The idea of looking at relative strength analysis and also incorporating time and price, day of week phenomena. Think about it like this. If you were to take this chart, NQ, okay, toggle it to uh, the weekly chart. So type in number one and W, okay, and it'll take you back to the weekly candle or weekly chart. That chart, candlestick, that we just closed for last week on Friday, yesterday. It is what would be otherwise deemed by other traders or you know, Steve Nielsen's uh, group of people. It would be viewed as many times like an indecisive candle because we opened, we traded down, created the tail or the width below the candle. And then we rallied up 
to our gap, which is what was called beforehand. And then it traded down away from that gap and closed high above the opening price. But there's a wick of both end of that candle on the weekly chart. It's a wick above it and a wick below it. So it's a very small little body portion of that weekly candle. So when I look at time-based charts, when I see that candlestick like that, I'm not looking at that as indecisiveness. I know that that high went to a specific level. And when I used to look at those candlesticks formations, I used to think to myself, okay, everybody else thinks that's indecisiveness. Steve Nielsen's not going to go in his books and talk to you real time and say, yeah, it, it made that because it was going up to that gap. So all those inefficiencies in education, because there's inadequacies in everything else out there in the world in trading, it's bullshit mostly. And they're not going to be able to tell you with a high degree of precision what's about to happen and why it should happen and what time it's going to occur. That's the difference between me. I'm a fucking cheetah in a greyhound race. Okay, I don't need to do all these other things for all of you. But if you're here to learn, listen and compare by contrast. The things I'm telling you to look for in price action, they're the key turning points. That's the framework. That's the beginning building blocks of you finding your model, finding those setups. In ES, let's go over to ES, and we'll close this carnival-like atmosphere with what I promised, which is spooz. All right, so you should be on a weekly chart for ESM2023 on TradingView. And look at the price action here on this. This is a turd. Like, this didn't do anything this week. It was nasty. But it did offer some sell side. It did offer some shorts. I, I called out the, uh, my, my mind is trying to think about when it was. I think it was Wednesday morning. I think it was Wednesday morning. I don't know, to be honest with you. I don't know what day it is because it's Saturday and I've been jet lagged because of driving down here. And when I, it, The bed's comfortable here, by the way. <laughs> but. When I'm away from my home, I, I, it takes me a, a day or two to kind of like, you feel like you're in a stranger's house. You know what I mean? So when we moved into our new house, uh, it was literally like a month before I wouldn't wake up in the middle of the night and look around like, where the hell am I at? But uh, going ES, let's drop into a daily chart. So you want to type in number one and hit the D and then enter. And that will open up your chart on ESM2023. That's your symbol for trading view in case you didn't know. There is a fair value gap on the daily chart on the May 5th, 2023. Okay, so that's a Friday. So if you highlight that, put that on your chart with a rectangle, and you would start by drawing it from the high on Thursday, May 4th, 2023, up to the low on the May 8th low. Then drag that rectangle to the right. Okay, and you're going to see that there's two candles sweep below it by just a little bit and that is on wednesday of this past week and friday of this past week now that you have that range <clears throat> you want to go and do the same thing with the tuesday fair value gap so you want to draw a rectangle this rectangle you want to make this red or something you know other than what you just drew for the other fair value gap so you're going to draw from the low, you're going to draw a rectangle from the low of May 1st, 2023, on your daily chart of ESM2023, so June contract for uh, E-mini S&P. And you're going to draw the rectangle over to the right to the high of May 3rd, 2023. You know, I thought I was, I was going to do a video, but, you know, I'm not. I'm going to use this as a filtering. If you can't go through your charts and replay this and do this through your charts, you can't learn from me. I'm not, I'm not going to hold your hand. OK, if you can't go into your charts and listen to me, I'm giving you the very candles to do this. This is why I like doing Twitter, because it, it, it separates the weak. It separates the, the chaff from the wheat. It takes the lions. And makes them hungry champions over these charts. They, these individuals that, that just simply want to have a handheld and, and just give it to me on a silver platter bullshit. OK, I can't coddle you anymore. Like, I, I can't do that because all I'm doing is making you weaker by doing it. Entertain me, ICT. Do, do all the work for me, ICT. Do all the heavy lifting and just give me the chart and what to focus on. I'm telling you what to look for. This is how we're doing it, okay? 
that fair value gap on the daily chart of May 2nd, 2023, that's Tuesday. The gap is formed with the low of May 1st, 2023, and the high of May 3rd. So you want to draw your rectangle to the right on your chart. And you'll see that there's two candles that touched into that gap. Those being on Wednesday, May 10th, 2023, and the high of May 11th, which is Thursday of this past week. Okay, so uh, my rectangle that I just did here for the premium, I have that shaded in like a like a pink or red hue, and then I have a blue rectangle for the fair value gap that was formed on May 5th. Okay, and then we're all obviously talking about the daily chart. So my focus was primarily on the long side for NQ because of the weekly gap. And it was showing a willingness to want to go higher when Dow and ES was unwilling to go higher. Every time ES and Dow would make lower lows, NASDAQ would push back and say, I'm not willing to go down there. That is a signature that's telling you when internals shift in the marketplace and anything that would be allowed to go higher is permitted to go higher. It's telling you, it's showing you like a billboard sign, okay? Neon sign flashing. This is the one that you want to be buying. This is the one you want to be buying. This is the one you want to be buying. Where did I learn that from? I learned that from a 1970s book from Larry Williams, How I Made a Million Dollars Trading Commodities Last Year. It's a small little section in that book. It's a small chapter. But folks, I'm telling you that fucking shit works. It's, it, it, it changed a lot of things about how I look at price. It changed the way I look at specific indices or markets that are closely correlated. Like those are the building blocks. That is not the entirety of my analysis. I took that information and supercharged it. Don't believe me. Go and look at his book. Go buy it. You should have it in your library anyway. I'm not going to get a kickback. I'm not giving you an affiliate link. I don't have an Amazon account where I can put a link up. And when you buy it, I get a kickback. Fuck all that. Go buy the book where the fuck you want to buy it. That, that book, it taught me the beginning stages of how I'm internalizing price action here. And I took it and supercharged it. There are certain things that repeat at certain times. Whereas you know, Larry Williams doesn't make any mention of that stuff. But that's the bit, that's the beginning. That was the the 1995 catalyst that changed for me where I was really reading that chapter and going through my, my charts and thinking to myself, there's something that I need to pay more attention to and I'm going to spend it in this. And I started looking at old data and I had data fucking shit. I had paid for a lot of resources for charts and things that were really old and before my time as a trader. And unfortunately, there was a website that doesn't exist anymore where you could pull up a daily chart of any futures contract for like 50 years back. And you could literally see the volume, the way the open interest was. It was, it was amazing. It was freaking amazing. But they went out of business. And just, I, I just wish, man, I, I wish they would come back. But it just doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore. So, But I would go back and look at all those old moves. And I was like, man. Like this is a treasure trove of studying and building a, a really rich understanding and tapestry of how price is booked, not just in futures, but every other asset class, except for crypto, because I don't co-sign for that. Okay, so there you go. But if you look at this premium fair value gap, which is formed on May 2nd of now again, we're on the daily chart of ES. So ESM. 2023 is your symbol for trading view. On your daily chart, hover your cursor over top of May 2nd, 2023. That's your premium fair value gap and a discount fair value gap was formed on May 5th. Okay. So there should be rectangles drawn on your daily chart and drop down into an hourly chart. So just type in 60 and enter and it should toggle your chart to a hourly chart. And look at the wonderful price delivery between those two fair value gaps. On the 10th, we delivered up into it. The bodies didn't even touch the premium. Then on the 11th at 3 a.m., 4 a.m., and 5 a.m., we wicked up into it, but the bodies still not up there. Every time we went up into that premium, fair value gap, we sold off down into 
the minimum of at least the high of the discount fair value gap, which would have been, and again, I, I shaded mine blue. And you're, now there's some of you are pissed off right now thinking, man, I, I don't know what he's doing. It's all in the very thing I'm talking about. It's in the record. I'm recording this. It'll be there. You just play it and do exactly what I'm doing and telling you what I'm doing with your chart. This is interactive. That way you'll see it on your chart. And when you see it and you annotate it, it's all you. It's your information, your annotations. You see it. I'm not pointing to it. You're drawing your own analysis and your own perspective from what it is I'm talking about in the chart. But you'll see exactly what I'm referring to. So think about it like overbought, oversold. Okay. Between these two fair value gaps, because I'm not interested in going long in ES. I wasn't interested in going long ES this week. I was only interested in going long in NQ. So NASDAQ was my choice for upside. And I said that ES was weaker than NQ. That was your tip off. Okay. If shorts are forming, you want to be focusing on shorting ES and not so much on NASDAQ. Look at the fair value gap that formed on Thursday at May 11th at 6 a.m. On your hourly chart for ESM2023. We roll back up into that at 8 o'clock in the morning. So that market report that came out at 8.30, that's what it's showing you, that price delivery. It went up, went a little bit above the low of the 5 a.m. candle, and then gave up the ghost and traded all the way down to 41.22 which is an old new week opening gap. I'll let you do your own analysis and study and find out which one that is. Oh, ICT, you, you're really getting bad at this teaching. <laughs> I never claimed to be the best teacher. And then the market traded again lower when below the low formed on Thursday at 10 a.m. on Friday, making the low at 2 p.m. And then repricing back to an old new week opening gap low at 41.36. And the high of that discount Daily fair value gap. So shorts only were the best moves for ES, in my opinion. Longs were better served on NQ. Go back to your NASDAQ chart. By having an expectation, anticipating price delivery to the upside on that weekly chart for ES, that gap. Remember the levels at 13,480.75 and the low of that gap being 13,453 even. That was the draw on liquidity. The market wants to reach up to there, and it did so. There was nothing really clear with ES showing no willingness to want to go higher with NQ. So it's telling you it's being held. It's in a holding pattern. That means it's being manipulated heavily, not being permitted to trade higher. But what market was telling you it could go higher? NQ. So therefore, if NQ is the higher reaching market that wants to go higher, it's being given clearance to trade higher because it's giving you signatures by saying, okay, on the 10th, it didn't make that lower low when ES and Dow did. So it's showing you, okay, there's SMT. And now does it want to make higher highs and do down close candles find support? Yes. So it's telling you order flow is bullish. So what do you reach for? Higher time frame objective. Where's the draw on liquidity? The weekly chart, that gap. What did your chart print? that gap. So when we're looking at price action, it's not just simply go out there and say, okay, well, ICT trades NQ. I'm going to trade the ES because that's going to be my model. That, that might be true sometimes, but you'll also get frustrated when it's a market like it we this in this past week where we had manipulation. Think of it like this. For Forex trading, when the dollar index is being held in consolidation, Forex pairs that are not coupled with a dollar will have extrapolated price moves. So you have to do a lot of analysis. You have to do one step more in your analysis to trade those pairs. I call them exotics. Dollar-based crosses, they're just the standards. So anything apart from a dollar-based Forex pair to me is an exotic. So if you're trying to trade those exotic pairs in Forex, you're better suited when the dollar index is not poised to move directionally so if it's being held in consolidation that's a green light go and i've taught this in core content by the way in case you haven't got to that point yet i go into great detail about it but there's cross pair manipulation that occurs in forex that if you don't have the understanding about what it is that the dollar is telling you if the dollar is being held in consolidation you don't want to be trading euro dollar 
you don't want to be trading pound dollar. You don't want to be trading Aussie dollar or New Zealand dollar or dollar yen or dollar Swissy. You don't want to be trading those pairs. You want to be trading the strongest performing currency. What would that look like? Well, what NASDAQ was showing here. Willingness to go higher when others aren't. Willing to make a lower low when others are making lower lows? No, it's going to repel and not say, I'm going to go lower like you. So that's telling you it's strong. Now, if you couple that with a currency that is showing easy price delivery going, making lower lows and failing to make higher highs, or here's one more advanced version of it, fair value gaps not getting filled or even retraded back up into. That's an exceedingly weak market. So if you compare and look for strong Forex currencies, not pairs, currencies individually, that are going higher or showing relative strength versus a currency pair that's weak, then between those two currency pairs, you find the exotic that makes that pair. And if it's the stronger being listed in the name of the currency pair first, then you want to be buying that exotic. And you're going to have a very handsome price run while the dollar goes nowhere. Mic drop. That's the shit that you don't learn in books, okay? That's the stuff that when you get with somebody that knows what's going on and how to read price and not just simply look at price action, you have to know, you have to know the lay of the land. You have to know the environment you're trading, the market profile, the schematic that the market itself is under. You have no idea. These yahoos out there are talking about they, 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 they're, they're masters. They're price action masters. Okay, The fuck you're master this. You ain't got any clue what you're doing. You have just a sprinkling of everybody else's shit, mostly mine. And you don't even know it. There's a difference between knowing and being familiar with. There's a difference between explaining something after it's happened, but not being able to do it in detail and call, you know, call it out in detail what it should be doing. I gave you, go back to um, go back to NQ. So NQ M2023. And let's go to a five minute chart. So just type a five and hit enter and you'll drop into. All right. And if you recall back on uh, actually, I think I miscalled the the time frame. Look at um, Wednesday. May 10th on a 15 minute time frame for NQM2023. So we're looking at NASDAQ June contract. And again, for trading view, the symbol you would type in would be NQM2023. And you want to put it on a 15 minute candlestick chart. And you want to take your cursor and move it over and hover over top of Wednesday, May 10th, 2023. And it's the 2.30 p.m. New York local time candle. That's a buy side and a balance, sell side and efficiency, fair value gap. You see that? Draw a rectangle on that and draw it to the right. You'll see that we drop down into that on the 10.30 a.m. Thursday, May 11th, 2023. We have a little bit of a mohawk where we just go down just outside of that low, the fair value gap, just a little bit that allows the algorithm to provide the liquidity for anybody that wants that low with a fair value gap. So to get that low booked on a short cover or to go long, that needs to offer what? At least one tick difference. So it has to go just outside the line. Okay. So we're not discouraged when price moves just a little bit outside of what we're looking for. It's still precise. And a mohawk is my way of this explaining how the market can sometimes color outside the line. In Forex, I've built in all my concepts with three to five pips of variance. And that's why I tell you, you know, the, the folks that always claim they got one pip and two pip stop losses and they can do it all the time and they always do it like that. Uh, you know, I always say, you know, that's bullshit because your broker, because I'm going to tell you, you know, if I ran a brokerage, I would do that shit. I would clean the floors with everybody that had that kind of shit, but they put their stop loss where I can expand that spread just a little bit more and get it. And I would trade against them. I would be book everybody. And this is the way it is because your broker's telling you they're doing it anyway when you sign up. You never read those fucking applications. You never read them. You know you didn't. You don't read them just like when you bank, you open up a bank account. You're saying, here's my money, and 
I agree to the rules that says that you'll give it back to me if you feel like giving it back or if the market provides you the means to do so. Until then, the money's technically legally yours. You don't read that, but that's exactly what you just signed up. You just signed up for that shit every single time. So we have to make certain allowances for price action. But there's not three or five handles of variance in Forex. I'm sorry, I'm sorry in futures trading, is it? Very small, up to one full point, which is four ticks. That's about enough for me. Anything more than that, I'm probably way off in my analysis. But you'll see that within four ticks, generally the things I'm teaching you are going to book. And one point slippage, we'll call it that, in terms of accuracy, I think that is, is that's astounding. I've never seen anybody else that have anything conceptually that allows for that just that small portion. And I don't even need that that much. I mean, look at the things I show you. Like it's usually right to the tick. But I allow for my own analysis. I allow for four ticks variance when I'm trading index futures. So in my analysis, in my stops and all these types of things, I allow and I build in that fluff that could allow for just a little bit of coloring outside the lines where it would otherwise scare other people. Like at some point, if people were looking at this as a student of mine and he had that fair value gap noted from May 10th on the 15 minute chart at 2.30, that had extended out and the candle forming on 10.30 on Thursday when it was bold face bearish and it was below that. I'm sure they were probably sweating thinking, man, is this thing going to go? Is this going to keep going? Is it going to keep dropping? No. It's, it's, it's allowing for that delivery to get the very low of the fair value gap. And then the market does what? It closes at the high of the fair value gap on that 10.30 a.m. And then it opens right at that fair value gap high and then runs away up to the upside. Drops back down into the order block that formed at 10.30 and then rallies higher. Back up into consequent encroachment of the weekly gap, that real liquidity void at 13,466.75. And subsequently find some support at the low of the gap on... 8 p.m. Thursday, and then rallies to fill that weekly gap. So you have price delivery that you can go back and back test. You can look at all these things and, and how they repeat. But I gave you a short on ES, and uh, it was a fair value gap down into a liquidity pool. And you saw me execute, obviously, on that. And then later in the day, so i got to go to ES now. So ESM2023. I gotta find my areas. I gotta find my annotations because I have them set to only show on five minute chart. So I gave you the uh, the fair value gap on Wednesday to look at, and then the forty one twenty seven liquidity. I'm trying to find a way to say this so that way it doesn't sound like I'm a discouragement to you. So allow me a moment to, to, to kind of like put this in a way where it's not so pointed. I, I don't feel comfortable when you show me trades that you've taken on days that I have already warned you about in terms of the risk. When I don't like or heart your tweet, don't think that I didn't see it. I, I see every tweet. Every single tweet that comes to me, either I don't agree with, or if I agree with, or if I find it's you know noteworthy or whatever, or I share in that sympathy, um, I'll retweet it. I don't heart your trade results because... I don't want to encourage you to do something in a time when I don't know where you are in your learning. Like, I don't know how long you've been studying. I don't know if you've ever made money. I don't know. But I don't know anything about every one of you. So when I'm wearing the hat of a mentor, 
and you're showing me your trades, whether they're profitable or wildly even profitable. Um, for instance, I saw a few people say, I just passed my funded challenge with that trade that I shared the other day with the silver bullet trade. And I knew sending that out, everybody would, that would ever take my trades did it that day. And I'm not trying to be an oracle, okay? A lot of, call, a lot of you call me Neo <laughs> or Morpheus, and a lot of you want me to evolve to the oracle, okay? Where you just come to me and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, okay? I, I don't want to be that. I'm not Neo. I'm not Morpheus. I'm IC fucking T. And I'm not trying to be anything apart from that. And I get anxiety when I see students taking risks in environments where I'm explaining to you that it's elevated risk. And in, in other instances and in other circumstances where we aren't in those types of climates, I would be high fiving you saying, yes, that's awesome. I'm proud of you. But I'm trying to be very cognizant to the influence I have as an educator. I don't want to influence you into thinking good behavior with limited understanding. And, and that means it's reckless then. Okay, Things that would otherwise be done in other market environments with more insight, more experience, that's what you're aiming for. But when I tell you we're in a... Uh, a high risk environment. We're in a, a, a different kind of climate right now. And you're new and you do something and you get a result that's positive or you make money or if your demo account does well, or if you get a funded account or it makes a money uh, transaction that allows you to get a payout based on that trade that I shared. Admittedly, I want you to understand how it makes me feel. Anyone else out there would be championing that and walking around like a pony show saying, see what I did, see what I did, see what I did. I gave this guy this, I gave this gal that, they made this, they made that. I'm telling you as the human being me, okay, I get really uncomfortable with that. And as much as I want to share in your success, I do, I absolutely want to do that. It makes me want to withdraw and not do what I'm doing by calling out moves like that. I don't want it. So... If you want more of what I'm doing when I do that stuff, please don't share your trade results by doing it. I've said this before. I'm asking you, please don't. I know it's exciting for you. And, and if you want to share it on your Twitter, don't include my handle. It's a simple thing as, as, as that. It's simple. Don't, don't tweet to me that you made this much money or you did that, you did that. When I'm telling you that the market climate is high risk. I'm not looking for clout. I've already earned it. I don't want students being led astray, thinking they're ready to do things when they're really not. And there's been times, even in my own early years, where I thought I knew something. And I later found out because of my infancy as a, as a trader, not understanding the markets when I first started. 1992 is a long time ago. And if you could see the journal entries that I had that were just, just terrible beating up sessions of myself you know, telling myself that, you know, I don't know this and I don't know, I should know this by now. And I should, and it's literally months since I started then. And I had these hard opinions of myself thinking that I should have learned my lesson about this or that. When in reality, I had no exposure to what it is I suffered. That was the first time I encountered it, but I was being so hard on myself that I was in my own journal beating myself up saying I should have known better when I had no understanding how to even identify that. So how could I, how could I have known better? Right? So I'm prone to be my worst critic. You know, I have trolls. Everybody has trolls. Okay. None of these fuckers could ever say anything to me worse than my own opinion about what it is that I think I should have done or shouldn't have done or how I could have done it differently. Because I have obsessively compulsive disorder. I have, I have a, a way of seeing things that is what normal people wouldn't pay too much attention to. It'd be like, okay, well, I don't give a fuck. It's, it is what it is. I obsessively, compulsively look at things beyond the normal perspective of, of, of the average person. And I'm hypercritical of myself, which is what got me here. 
it was a weakness. It was an impediment in the beginning, but I turned it around and said, okay, I was given this for a reason. I believe there's a creator. And the world will tell you, you should be on medication and be drugged. I fucking will not take no medicine. I'm bipolar. It's hard wrestling with that. It's very hard. It's hard as shit wrestling with that. But I used all these things that's labeled in our world as disabilities, mental health issues, uh, um, something wrong with a person or whatever, crazy, insane, unstable, all that bullshit. And I said, you know what? It's a fucking superpower because my give a fuck is beyond the normal. My give a fuck level is super fucking human. I want to know every fucking thing about these ticks, these fluctuations in price action, and I want to know everything there is to know about it. That's what made me Inner Circle Trader. That's what makes me who I am. Nobody gives a fuck about these candlesticks as much as I do. The time they make them, none of that stuff. In the 90s, I was doing shit with price data that nobody ever even considered before. Wasn't in books, wasn't in anybody's bullshit. Okay, everybody was doing moving all average crossovers and stochastic and RSI and CCI fucking overbought oversold. That's that's just the way it was. And intraday trading really hadn't kicked off. It was everybody was trading on daily charts because everybody was just associating what they learned from the retail educators at that time. And it was a slow transition into intraday trading. I was coming up during that. When I was becoming a student of the markets in 1992, really putting an effort into it, not when I was 15 years old by my uncle showing me charts. If I wanted to be real and tell you when I really started looking at price and shit like that, it would be when I was 15. I'm not being, in my opinion, genuine enough to say, okay, my concern, because I didn't give a fuck. At that time, at 15 years old, I was worried about martial arts and, and girls. That's what I was worried about. So markets were completely alien to me. I didn't care. But when I started working a job and hated it, wasn't making very much money, it fell into my lap again saying, okay, well, there's probably a sign to this. You know, I, I turned my nose to it. My uncle talked about it. He made money with it. So, you know, apparently I must be meant to do this. So I reacted and started digging into it in 1992. But it wasn't until November 5th of 1992 on a Thursday evening at 9 p.m. in my aunt and uncle's family room. That was the that was the moment. That was the very birth of Inner Circle Trader. That was the day I said, I am going to learn how to do this. I might not be a success in real estate. I might not be a success in sports. You know, I maybe never opened up a martial arts dojo like I wanted to when I was a teenager. And there's a lot of things I thought I was going to do and, and th some of the things I tried to do and failed. And I just said, I'm not interested in those things anymore. This, this here, I never said I fucking give up. I had to quit and take breaks because I just couldn't, I couldn't deal with the pressure I was placing on myself. And maybe that's what you do too. But quitting is not a fucking option. You have already been infected with this. So you might as well just fucking roll your sleeves up and say, okay, I know I want to do this. I know everybody else around me says it's bullshit. It's a pipe dream. And it's going to be so hard to learn how to do it. And guess what? Everybody that's ever made money in this thought the same thing. And their friends and family and influences around them were saying the same thing. What was the difference? They told them to go fuck themselves. I'm not listening to you. You didn't do this and, and make money and, or you didn't do this and fail and learn anything from it. You're just telling me from your fucking Carl perspective, you're a nine to fiver. Okay. You're a 401k American dream. Get into a fucking 30 year mortgage debt, pay all this fucking interest and consider that success. I don't listen to people like that. I've never listened to motherfuckers that do that. If you're going to work and you have a good job, you aren't a fucking mentor to me. If you have a good career and you go to work for somebody else, you're not a fucking mentor to me because you're not going to teach me any fucking thing that I want to do. I never wanted to fucking work for these people that I worked for. I never wanted to work for them. I never wanted to do that. I wanted to go to school, get an education, computer science, information systems specializing, and be a systems analyst. And I wanted to get some experience at a firm and then I was going to branch off and have my own firm. I was going to do that. That was what I was going to do. My, my whole 
point of living this adult life was to be an entrepreneur, my own person. Fuck working for somebody else. And this right here, my friends, this right here, this industry that you're listening to this goofball talk to you about right now that sounds like he's hopped up on fucking goofballs. This is the last bastion of free enterprise. This is it, folks. Look around. Every fucking thing is changing. Everything is changing. Brick and mortar stores. Look around. How many places in your neighborhood are closing up? How many commercial places in those strip malls, in the uh, commercial real estate areas, how many fucking businesses that you've seen now, nobody's in there. It's vacant. How fast is someone moving on in there? They're sitting there empty, ain't they? Look around, folks. Shit is changing. The way we do business, the way people are going to work, the way we have careers, that's all changing right in front of you right now. And I'm here to tell you, that the shit you're learning ain't going to change. It's either there is no markets or everything I'm teaching you will keep fucking working. So stop worrying about that. Use the time, pour into yourself, invest in yourself. Because the only thing you're doing is kicking the can down the road farther and farther by you not just tearing into this saying, I'm going to do this. It's going to probably take more time than I want it to, but it's okay. Because I have set a resolve in my heart, in my spirit, in my mind. I'm not changing. I'm not deviating. And a motherfucker out there is going to tell me that this ain't for me because I know it is. The more somebody tells me it ain't for me, the more I'm in love with it. It just means that you can't fucking do it. And it's going to be even more better once I get there and you get to witness it. And I don't have to rub your fucking nose into it. You're just going to see me live better by it. That's the best revenge. That's the best revenge for your naysayers. The people that say, you aren't going to be successful at this. Don't bother. You're going to lose your money. You're going to do this. You're going to waste all this fucking time. Laugh at these motherfuckers under your breath. Two years from now, shit's going to be different for you. It's going to be totally different for you. Everybody else is going to be struggling to find another way to make their fucking ends meet. You got this. You got this. Every fucking Monday to Friday, there's an opportunity for me. Just like there's a work day for everybody else. In a couple days, everybody's going to fucking work on Monday. And they had to fucking work until Friday just to get the same thing that they got the previous week. Time stolen. You prostituted your life for somebody else to say, this is what you were worth to me. And what did you lose in the process? You didn't see your wife. You didn't see your husband. You didn't see your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your kids, your friends. You didn't have peace of mind or relaxation whatsoever. You're fucking stressed out because you're in debt and you have no way out. Folks, it isn't for everybody, but for everybody that wants to dig their heels into it, it is for you. It is for you. And don't let anybody tell you that you can't do this. You can. It's hard as fuck to get through what you do to yourself. When you stand in front of yourself and you say, what's the point of me doing this? Or I failed yesterday. Or, I failed last week. I should I just give up. Who's stopping you? The market didn't. Your friends aren't right. Your coworkers aren't right. Carl's not right about you failing in this. You might as well just warm up and tie yourself up to the company just like he is. Company man, Carl. It's you. You have the control of sticking with this come hell or high water until you get it or stopping. There's nothing out there, folks. There's nothing out there that's going to be an impediment to you succeeding but you. It's just time and effort. You have to make an effort, an honest effort. Not, well, I took some notes in five pages of, five pages of scribble bullshit. And ICT is full of shit because you know, here's my proof. Here's my notes. Get the fuck out of here. Get out of here. That's not, that's not effort. That's bullshit. Getting in here, showing up every day, doing back testing, getting data collected. How many times does this form? How many times does it perform? How many times does it develop a setup at this specific time? How many times does that happen over the course of a week, of a month, in the course of a year with one asset? And realistically think to yourself, if you just got one of those opportunities over the course of the week and you stopped, you exercised due diligence and discipline and said, I don't need to do more. I don't have the experience yet. So if I can get this, I'll stop and study the rest of the week. 
and go at it again the following week. That's a winning trader. That's a fucking market maven. That's somebody that has absolute control over themselves when 99.9 .9 motherfucking percent, 99% of these fucking traders out there, whether they're profitable or not, they don't really have control of themselves. Even the people that make money, if they were honest with you, they'd be telling you, man, you have no idea how many times I fucking took these trades this inch a week. I did this and did this and this. I was, you know, I, I mean, I made a lot of money. Look at the end of the week. Here's what I did. But look at all this other bullshit I went through. They're never going to do that. They're never going to do that. And you know what's nice about me? I can only talk about what I talked about, right? You see the fucking shit on Twitter? That's it. You see it. That's the points I made reference to. Was there anything deleted? No. Does your chart show all the market turns at those price points and those times? Yep. Did it go where I said it was going to go? Yep. Can you trust the logic? Absolutely. Will it repeat? Absolutely. So it's not a lack of evidence that this shit works or not. It works. What's lacking is how much, how much do you have in the tank to stick with it? And sometimes you need to fill back up. You need to fill your tank up with energy. The give a fuck is probably really low on some of you if you've been losing or not feeling like you're learning. I'm reminding you folks, this market right now, over the last 30 years, is the most challenging for me. There's so many things going on all around the world that there's huge pockets of what would be normally filled with a lot of interest institutionally, you're not seeing that right now. What does that mean in, in layman's terms? What I'm saying to you is because risks are so high, World War III bullshit, to, uh, Taiwan invasion, US invasion, and yes, we fucking are being invaded, all these fucking things are, are happening. Central bank digital currencies, bank failures, okay, banks are gonna exist. Okay, and then just get one thing. Banks are gonna exist. They're creating a situation that scared the fucking shit out of everybody. And they're going to say, if we don't have a central bank digital currency, we're going to fall victim to this, that, or the other thing. They have to come up with another COVID. They got to come up with another 9 11. They got to come up with another Saddam Hussein, a fucking terrorist ghost killer that's going to get you, you know, some way, shape, or form. They got to, they have to scare you. That's what's happening right now. And people are people. And large corporations have fund managers which are people. And we're all seeing the same Mickey Mouse shit. A lot of risk. Does it make sense for these institutional firms that take other people's money and place it in risk, does it make sense for them to just go in there and do dog pile on any old thing right now? No. There's a lot of cash reserves on the sideline right now. They're not comfortable with taking risk. They're telling clients, we have to sit still for a little bit. You know, just we're waiting for, for, for new developments. That's what's going on, folks. That's why the market's stagnant. That's why the market's doing what it's doing. Big money ain't moving right now. But when big money starts king into the marketplace or coming out of it, then we have our dance. Then it becomes easy trading again. But you, me, anybody else out there saying otherwise can't change that. So you have to exercise patience. You just got to relax and settle down. Just sit still. This won't be the last time you have to do that in your career. There'll be other future things that cause reason for us to sit still and try not to be so aggressive. You got to be a little bit more passive as a trader right now. Contrast what you saw me in years before where I could go into a marketplace and buy, sell, buy, sell, up, down, up, down, all over the place. Just about every single intraday swing, I'm in it. Recording it, doing executions, the whole business. Is that the climate we're in right now? No. Nope. So if I'm taking the time to tell you that, don't be selective in your hearing and think, well, that's just for him. Because this other guy here said this and that. This other guy out there saying that bullshit ain't fucking telling you what's going to happen before it happens to the, to, to the tick. He's not telling you what's going to happen. Okay. He's cherry picking this, that, and the other thing that makes sense after it's happened. I'm telling you before it happens. I'm showing you what to look at, where it's going to form, how it's going to behave. And I want you to understand that that is important. When we come out of this funk, I don't know when, 
and the markets loosen up and we start having bigger price swings on the daily chart, we're still in a range, folks. On the daily chart, we're not we're not changing any major uh, higher time frame profiles. We're still consolidating. And that's boring to many of you action hounds that you just want to get in there and, and get these big wild price runs. They'll come, but you gotta wait. That's the that's the infancy. That factor of inexperience that many of you young 20 year olds that think you know everything right now, even if you're making lots of money with my stuff or other people's stuff, you don't know shit. You ain't been around long enough. And if you were being honest, you could see that these markets are totally different than where they were five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And sure as fuck different from 20, 30, 30 years ago. But you're not used to these adjustments because many of you started when we had these really big, fast runs and volatility be off the charts. And everything has been geared. OK, here's the here's the part nobody's talking about. Everything has been geared to high frequency trading right now with the expectation we're going to have big ranges when we're not getting big ranges. So what is their model doing? Sitting still. It's idle. So if large flows aren't coming in from an institutional stance, then we're not going to see large extrapolations in price delivery and big ranges on the daily chart. That's it. That's as simple as it. That's market 101. So there's no reason for you to get upset. There's no reason for you to push real hard and take stupid fucking risk to try to get funded, to try to get a payout. You got to relax and settle down because if you can't wrestle that down now, when you do have a lot of money, you're going to lose it all. Because you won't recognize these climates, these things that are occurring right now, they will occur again in your lifetime. There's going to be times when the market just acts stupid. It's being held in consolidation and you want it to move. You want it to leave that range and you can't make it. You cannot make that happen. So don't look at your trading as a way of satisfying that itch. You have to sit the fuck down. Don't do anything or be very selective in what you're doing. And I have tools for that. I'm teaching it to you. You see more evidence of it this week. 40 handles on that ES short. I don't remember how many handles I had on NQ. I recorded the execution showed it to you. And I did another one on uh, a small little scalp that I didn't share, but it was with my son. But like maybe I want to say about 100 handles or so. And I'm telling you, you can do extremely well with just 25 handles for the week. You have to lower your expectation. Slow down. Make things nice and slow and boring. You'll learn better. You'll retain more information. And then when the markets loosen up and get faster, you won't need to change anything. You'll just do more of what you've already been doing. That's the only thing that changes, but everybody else will lose their fucking mind and get crazy and take stupid risks and over leverage because they want to catch the next big 500 handle run or 500 pip run because this, that, and the other things occurring. That's what 30 years does for you. I didn't think this way when I first started. I didn't think this way in my first six years. That's one of the defining hallmarks to why it took me six years to get to where I am because I didn't have a mature mindset about it. I just thought it was go, 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 button push, button push, button push. I wasn't afraid of shit. I'd get in there and boom, 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 boom. I got 81 ways to get into a motherfucking market. And guess what? Entry metals and entry techniques is, is not a deficit for me. I can find a way to get in. I will get in there. If it's a move, I, will, I have something that will get me in there. And there isn't a lot of moves forming right now. But the things that do form, you have a skill set that's being taught to you on a conceptual basis that allows you to engage it. It might not be your model of choice. It's okay. It's good for you to learn. And over time, you will get this experience. You will get this understanding about yourself and how to control yourself, which is paramount. Not enough said about that in the market. Not enough said and taught by educators about that. It's okay to not do something. 
I don't know why this this stigma has been placed on. Oh well, this person's waiting. I've taken this trade. This trade. Yeah, the fucking trades you're taking are high risk, and you just got lucky. I'm aware that I was doing a lot of that when I first started. It was painful to admit that to myself, because then when I was 27 years old, I thought I knew everything. And based on what I know now, <sighs> night and day, like not even pre-K level understanding compared to today. But at the time, shit, I thought I knew everything. And that's what happens to you and these other educators that are just now finding themselves. You have to listen to people that's been around for a while. That's one, of, that's one of the best things you can do and best piece of advice. If someone's brand new, whether they make a lot of money or not, unless they have learned from someone that has done it for a long time and they stick to the rules that that long timer has put forth and has tried and true method, chances are you're probably learning from a one-hit wonder. And I mean that with all due respect. I, I'm not trying to shit on anybody or say, you know, what you have done for yourself or what you've done with your little communities or whatever isn't noteworthy. I'm just being honest because there was a time in my life as a young man, I thought I had it all figured out and I didn't not even close. I know when not to walk forward. I know when to take a step back. I know when to sit still. And 99% of the people out there that act as a trading guru educator, they don't know. They don't know that they just know get in. Because they have to keep up with this level of expectation that they've placed on their viewership. I don't, I don't have to give you a setup every single day. When I talk, it matters. When I'm pointing to something, it's significant. And I'm comfortable with being still, even when you're all expecting me to do more. Are you comfortable? I guarantee you, you're all itching. Like, what the hell's going on? Why is this, why is this guy not talking? Why is he not tweeting? Something's going on. Something this and something that. Um, <laughs> uh, this is for the uh, the funded account guys. There's one company that does all these things to try to get me to trade in their shit. Uh, you're never going to see me trade any of your funded account bullshit, okay? Because you're not going to copy anything. I've, I've, I will never allow you to copy anything, okay? Um, if I want to give to a charity, I'll give to charity. I don't need you to do it. If you want to do a charity, give your own fucking money that you made from other people to a charity. There you go. Me making money with a, a, a $200,000 account and you give it away to charity where you get the benefit of the tax write-off. You get all the credit, but you copy my fucking trades too. And look, it's, that's, there's, no, there's no upside for that. Okay, People that learn from me, they know I can do this. They're doing it. I don't need to rep your company for doing that. And you benefit. It's all you benefiting for it. I'm not, like, I'm not stupid. And anybody that has a brain can see this shit. So... <laughs> There was really no other place to place that. <laughs> I was going to do it in the beginning, but I almost forgot to mention it in here. So, I, I, like I said, I'm not interested in your 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 funded account bullshit. I'm trying to work with my son Cameron, so that way he can do it. You know, he's he's trying to wrestle with these demons he's already created for himself, being a young man, impatient, trying to treat it like a video game, which it's not. He's found out it's not. And you wrestle with a lot of stuff that you bring to it. He's had success in other things that he's done. And he thought it was going to just translate into trading. He's going to find his own way and be able to say this, that, and the other thing. Say, no, I did it my way, Dad. Just like Cody tried to do it, and Cody fucking failed. Trading crypto bullshit, okay? Dad knows what the fuck's going on, but Dad has kids. It's like everybody else. You, you know what you were doing as a fucking teenager, young man, young woman. You know what it's like not listening to your parents. You didn't think they understood any fucking thing. Oh, these people, they don't get it. These old fucking geezers. <laughs> Believe me, he's eating crow right now. He doesn't like it, but it's okay. It's good for him. It's good fucking medicine. It just means it's going to be harder for him to learn to get through that stuff, which is why I teach the way I do. You don't have to have that scar tissue to learn this. You don't have to. But some of you just simply want to go around and share scars and say, this is what I had to put myself through. And I learned from this and that and nothing like it's a badge of honor. Like, I wish I didn't have all that stuff. I wish I could come in and say, I never did any of that shit. I learned the right way, and it's kept myself from learning to, 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 to do it correctly. Hold on one second. So 
anyway, my wife just got back to the room. So she's going to be wanting to do something with me. So I'm going to close this one here. But I think I've covered enough today. Gave you a little bit of a woodshed moment. Gave you some encouragement as well. Uh, put your nose into the chart so that we had to do it yourself. And reminded folks of what matters most and what's the most difficult thing in this. It's you. The person that you are that brings all of your character flaws, all of your strengths, they are going to be the weaknesses in your trading. And I didn't say that wrong. All of your strengths, the thing that you feel are the, the very strength that you are as an individual, that's the very thing that trading will whip your ass with. The thing that you think that makes you the best thing in everything else is going to be the very undoing that unfolds in trading. What does that mean? Confidence. My son came in confident. And now he's not confident at all. He thought he could do it because everything else he was good at. So he came in with overconfidence. Some of you come in here thinking, oh, I'm, I'm patient. I'm patient. And you discover you're not fucking patient at all. You're impatient. So when you find out whatever that character strength is for yourself, coming into this, you want to be very, very careful what you recognize in yourself as what makes you strong. What makes the, What's the good qualities that you have? And that's going to be the very thing that the market uses psychologically to undo you. And that's why you never see it coming. Nobody starts this and sees how they're going to end up failing because they focus on their strengths and they don't identify their weaknesses and take the time to fortify those weaknesses and build themselves up and identify that they do have weaknesses. The people that come in narcissistically thinking they have everything, demigods, I'm a demigod. <laughs> what the hell? They're the worst because they have so many character flaws that they will wreck themselves constantly. And they'll only champion the very few times that they're consistently doing something right. And that's unfortunate because that's something that needs a lot of work to fix and correct. And certain personalities aren't willing to do that. They, won't, they aren't willing to identify that they have weaknesses. And in trading, you have to identify what they are. Otherwise, if you don't, you'll ignore the weaknesses and have too much confidence in what you believe is your strength. And those strengths will be your undoing. And you'll blow your account. You'll fail. And it will be demoralizing to you because what are you doing subconsciously? You're thinking back, this was the best I had. I came in with these strengths. And I failed. I can't do it. I'm quitting. And you're just doing it wrong. That's all. You're just doing it wrong. You need to change and recalibrate and approach it from a different angle and give yourself a lot more time and flexibility and permission to not do it right in the beginning. That's what learning's like. But whenever you start adding money to it, now it becomes something totally different in it. You have to be right. You have to be profitable. Otherwise, you're broke or you're failing or you've, you've lost your account. It changes the score keeping mechanism from just feeling like you enjoy doing this to are you making money or are you not making money? In the beginning, you can't think of it like that. You have to know who you are, discover how you're going to undo yourself and wreck yourself and derail yourself. And it's always the person. It's not the method. It's not. It's not the fucking method. It is the person. Because good money management can work with a shitty system. Proof of it is flip a coin. Flip a coin and risk very, very small amounts. Let runners run. You won't make millions of dollars with it, but it's better than you trying to do what you've done in the past because it's a rule-based idea. And you're limiting losses, which is the first rule in trading. Control capital. Preserve capital. That's the rule number one. But when you're coming into this as a new trader, a new student, you're not thinking that. You're thinking, how much can I make? How fast can I make? You see, those, those are the things you're coming into it with. How fast can I quit my job? Not how can I make sure I don't lose all my money? How can I make sure I preserve capital? Even knowing that I can take losing trades, I can still weather that and make more money. That's the difference. 
That's the difference between someone that has a realistic expectation to investing in trading versus someone that just wants to get in here, like the crypto phase. Okay, so many people got into trading because of Bitcoin going to you know, 60,000, 70,000 almost. They never would have touched any markets ever. Stock market's always been there. Commodities have always been there. The crypto came out and everybody else was sitting on the sidelines thinking, man, everybody's getting rich with crypto. I'm going to go in there and pour my money into it at 60,000. If it drops a little bit, average in, hold on for dear life. And it keeps on dropping, keeps on dropping, keeps on dropping. And now they're demoralized. And they're thinking, oh, you know, this nobody makes money trading. They came in with their strength. Their strength is they're going to do what everybody says is risky at the time when everybody had already done it. Everybody was chasing it. And when the mania was high, that's what I told everybody. All my long-term students know this. I said, we're done. <laughs> we're done. And it dropped. And it doesn't mean I'm a good crypto, crypto trader. It just means that I understand market psychology. I understand how traders are victimized. When they're in that loser cycle and when mania comes, it's it. They're going to put the brakes on it and start taking it the other way. But those traders that came in when crypto was running hot, well, who was left after that? Nobody. You're talking about John Q. Public, the people that would have never done any type of, of, of investing or trading. They finally took the leap of faith to get into that stuff. What are they feeling right now when it tanked? You think they make think they feel like they made a good investment? Buying it at 60,000 plus, 50,000 plus? And it went all the way down to wherever it went. I don't even know if I had where it went. And I don't even know, you know, I don't even know where it's at right now, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm talking in obviously, you know, in, in previous conversations in the past. I mean, it could be wherever it is, I don't know now, but that expectation that you hold over yourself coming in, that you think that you're going to be good at trading because of this, that, and the other thing, uh, that's never going to be the strength. Like I thought my obsessive compulsiveness would be my undoing when in fact that's the very thing that makes me ICT. I would have not been able to stay with this, number one. I would have not been able to identify certain things that brought attention on myself and all of a sudden found myself in the presence of people that you would never meet. And gifted with insight. And here it is. You know, I'm sharing it with you and you're seeing the fruits of it with other people doing it all by their own steam. And I'm so proud of that. I'm proud of that. I'm proud to see students that stick with it. They didn't listen to the naysayers. They didn't listen to the people around them that said they couldn't do it. Their spouses, when they don't agree with it, that's hard. That's so hard. If you have a, a relationship with somebody that doesn't believe in you or believe in what you're doing, you, you might as well never bring it up or talk about it because you're going to add more dimensions to the difficulty and impossibility of succeeding in this because you're torn between who you love. You don't want to stress them out, but you don't want them to stress you out. You want them to encourage you. But if they don't, if they don't believe in it or subscribe to the same views you hold in, in this, you can't convince them of it. And what that does is it creates a, a an insatiable desire to prove that there's no reason for them not to trust you. So you take on what bigger risks you trade more. You do reckless bullshit to try to run up the account. Just anything. Don't think I'm fucking talking the truth. Think about the last time you got in an argument. You want to be able to show her. You want to be able to show him. So that way you can ease their minds and their doubts. And that way maybe you can convince them into encouraging you. I got news for you. If they aren't encouraging you then, they're not going to encourage you later. So stop looking for outward affirmance. Affirmance. You can't. You can't. You can't base your success or willingness to stick with this on the premise that other people support what you're doing. Nobody thought I was going to be able to figure this stuff out. Nobody. Nobody. 
And my uncle, who introduced me to the idea when I was 15 years old, got pissed off when I started figuring the shit out. You would think that, man, he'd be like, wow, you're, this is, this is really great. Continue what you're doing. No, never. Fucking, not one time did he do that. Not one fucking time. He sat in my passenger seat of my fucking Corvette telling me in bawling tears saying that I don't understand why I couldn't get this. I did it before you and I'm jealous. His fucking words. And I'm like, what the hell, dude? Really? <laughs> That's what you see in all this stuff? You resent me because I'm able to do it because I put a lot of effort into it? I studied and studied and studied? No. So stop looking at other people for validation. Stop looking at other people to encourage you. If you need other people to encourage you, you are not fucking passionate about this. And you have to be in love with it. You have to love this shit. You have to live this shit. Because if you can't do that, you aren't going to make it. Because losing trades will come. Drawdown periods will come. Times when the market gets tough and you can't find your way in it, it's going to happen. That shit's always going to be there. And if you can't find the encouragement in yourself to stick to the rules, trust that the process will yield the results that you're looking for, not on the timetable you're looking for, and certainly not on the timetable that your fucking friends and family want you to have. To justify their doubts. Fuck their doubts. Who gives a shit if they don't like what you're doing? If they don't believe it's going to happen. They're not doing it. You are. You're putting the fucking work and effort into it. And when it comes time for you to pull out the fruits of what it is you're putting the hard effort into. And they're your spouse. They're your significant other. They get to share in, in that reward. Whether they change their tune after that or not. Who's a fuck? That's not why you're doing it. You're doing it because you want to do this. You believe in it. I don't look at my wife who doesn't like the fact that I'm still talking to you right now. I guarantee you she's now one out on the balcony. That's her way of letting let me know you've talked too much today. But I got to get this off my fucking chest. And I don't have to apologize. And I don't have to see her attitude for a couple minutes until we go somewhere and get something nice and eat and whatever. But it, that's the shit that goes on when you're in a relationship. Relationships complicate this. It is so hard to balance not only your fucking self in this, but if you have a spouse or a significant other or if your partner is not on the same page with you with this shit, don't talk about it. Find an avenue or an outlet that if you're having difficulty, you want to talk. In that regard, I think a community is you know, warranted or it's beneficial. Like that guy, um, his Twitter handle is ICT Concepts. He, he's got a nice group of people. They all come together and they usually come together after I do one of these Twitter spaces. And they, you know, kind of like provide a, a, a soundboard for everybody else to to take the opportunity to say, "What did you get from that discussion?" And what does that mean for you? And what does it, how does it resonate with you? And what did you get from that? Or how did it make you uh, think about things? Did it challenge you in any way? You know, and hearing other people's perspectives and what they go through, I, I, that's that's great. I wish I was listening to it before I started listening to it. Because it's real people going through real shit, and sometimes it's not the good stuff. Sometimes it's them going through hardships, and they just need to be encouraged because they're not getting the encouragement with the people they have around them. They're loved ones. I'm doing the quotes in the air with my fingers right now. Remember, that should be a strength, right? Your loved one, your spouse should support you in this. They should be behind you 110%. Honey, go get them, tiger. You're not going to get that shit. Not most of the time. If you have it, you are a unicorn and be appreciative of that. Be thankful. Take the time out when I'm done with this and say, you know what? I wanted to let you know that I really appreciate you supporting me in this because it's very hard. And it's very hard for me to manage everything that needs to go along with finding success in this. And I can't imagine how hard it would be if you weren't behind me. You need to take the time and give that the acknowledgement to that person if it's happening. It's probably not. But if it is happening for you, you know, you're a very lucky person. You're very blessed to have that because 90% of the time you're going to find that every one of us is coming through the same fucking shit the same way through the trenches out of the fucking gutters. Okay. We got to pull ourselves out of nobody supporting us. Nobody encouraging us. No one saying, keep going. I didn't have it. I did not have it. 
And it was many times I thought about saying, fuck this. I can't, I can't overcome myself. I keep fucking up this stuff. I'm getting in the way. I keep bringing this into the equation. I'm trying to prove myself to this girl, to this woman, my ex-wife, my new girlfriend, my future wife, my this, my children, all that kind of shit. And that stuff, everybody wrestles with it. Everybody wrestles with it. Mark Douglas doesn't talk about it. <laughs> this is the real shit, the rubber meets the road stuff, brass tacks. And it's uncomfortable. But when you hear other people talk about it, it's therapy. Because it feels like you aren't broken. It feels like there's not a problem with you. It's you being a human being, trying to do something extremely technical, extremely complicated, and you're trying to wrestle with human reasoning in something that has no human reasoning behind it. It's all algorithmic. And that's why you have to take the elements of humanism out of it and think about how people can lose money and how someone else can get their seat on the bus. Because that's what this is all about. That's all this business is. It's about taking from those who can have it taken from them and then profiting from that. That's how this business works. That's how this industry runs. And there is no way around it. It's, it's, it's packaged and marketed in a way where the average person can invest and build a good future for themselves. And very few find that. Very few find that. So what's the repeating success story? The small elite do all the good stuff. They make money. They live on you know, high on the hog. And the average person finds failure, frustration, and they run away saying nobody can do it. And yet there's new suckers that come into the industry all the time. Every single day there's new people coming out and finding a reason to get in here and, and speculate. And social media keeps that, that rotating door turning. But if you're, if you're stuck in that rotating, revolving door and you haven't found your place yet, you know, hopefully this conversation kind of like sparks that you have to look internally. Because you can't look at your spouse. You can't look at your wife. Like, I don't look at my wife to encourage me with this. Like, I, I don't, I don't, I, I can't rely on that. She's not going to see it the way I see it. My children aren't going to see it the way I see it or want them to see it. Um, if my parents understood, you know, what it is I do. They wouldn't. They wouldn't understand it. They they don't they don't have a capacity to understand what it is that we do. My mother's got a sixth grade mentality. She she dropped out of school in sixth grade back you know, when I was you know, in her in her stomach <laughs> basically. You know, she said that's it. I'm not I'm not going to finish school. My father's living out the rest of his existence in Jessup, Maryland living two, uh, two consecutive life sentences plus 20 years and plus whatever time he's got for trying to ex uh, escape from the Maryland Penitentiary in 1983 or E4. They don't have the capacity to understand what we're doing or what it is that I do and what I'm able to teach and share with you all. So I don't look out externally for other people to encourage me except for you. You, the student. And I tell you things like, don't share your trade results with me because, like the movie Fight Club, the first rule of Fight Club, we don't talk about Fight Club. Because for me to feel confident that I can share with you, that I can be open with you, is that you're not going to give me things to overcomplicate my frame of mind. When I'm sharing things and I see what I see in the chart, at the time I share them, I'm not thinking about Tom, Dick, and Harry in this collection or community of people that's going to take the information and do something reckless with it. I'm thinking about the student that sees me as someone that's taking my time, taking my energy and my resources and making them available to you free of charge, talking to you in a medium where I'm not monetizing shit. This is all free. I'm on vacation right now. My wife's looking at me like, what the fuck are you doing? You, she just said, I'm leaving. <laughs> I want to see you succeed. And I don't want you to give me feedback that derails me as the mentor. You know, tell me you you made this and you made that. That, that, that makes me feel like I don't want to do it again. So if you want more of that, don't do that. Okay, I, I'm not looking for high fives. You shouldn't want my high five. You don't need it. If you've done something right, you, you don't need anybody else to tell you you did it right. 
You don't need me to critique it. You don't need anybody else to critique it. If it feels right and you did everything based on the rules, that's all you need. You log it and you go forward. So that's going to be it for this one. Hopefully you got something out of it. I went a little bit longer than I said I was going to go. <laughs> Always works like that. So I will be with you on a tweet tomorrow. I'll be tweeting the, the person I believe should receive that 20 or 200K Royal Challenge. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, I, I believe I had the highest views on that. I can't remember the company. I apologize. But uh, my choice will be made at 5 p.m. tomorrow on, on Twitter. I will tweet the company that sent out that, I think it's the funded trader or something like that. The funded trader or funded trader. Uh, that that company I have no affiliation with. I'm not kick, I'm not getting any kickbacks. I'm not in any partnership with them. But I will tweet their handle and the person I believe should be gifted that 200K Royal Challenge at 5 p.m. tomorrow. And so I'll talk to you next time. Be safe.